much, Karen, for the really nice uh, presentation, and also to Eduardo for all the invitation and for coordinate and organize all these uh, lectures in a really great way. So today we will talk about talks. So I will uh, uh, tell you about the brains, and then we can discuss what do you think if uh, getting only a cerebral response, we can infer more about the dogs or not if you want uh, if you have a dog i would love to hear about your experiences but uh, we can start with the presentation mm -hmm. so today uh, we will talk only about words but they are other really nice experiments with fMRI about the dog brain how it's working and we are interested in general how is uh, the dog uh, brain responding to our words because as you know the speech is a very powerful uh, stimuli for us but what about the species uh, around us so here i always like so much to start with uh, this quote and it say if we have the challenge to understand the mind of another species why should we not choose our best friend for this endeavor? And for me, this quote was really a great inspiration because I say, yes, uh, even in that time, I only have a cat. But after this, I decided to start my PhD, studying not the mind, but the brain of the dogs. And I think it's an excellent model to understand more about the evolution of our cognitive abilities, but also to understand how the evolution is working in another species, if our way is the only way, of course not. So uh, they are really interesting questions about this. In, when we study uh, using a comparative uh, approach in neuroscience, we, can, we have different options. One option is to study uh, one species, but uh, with different tools. In this example, with electrodes, the rats, and also with the MRI. Then there is the approach to when we have the same tool in this example and scanner, but with different species, as we, we are talking about dogs, here is a nice dog. And there's another option when we have different tools for different species, but in this talk, we will center in this approach too. And indeed, uh, when this started more than 10 years ago, it was an impressive and really, really nice way to study the, the brain of other species because uh, the, one of the first uh, researchers on the field uh, wondered and discovered, okay, we can, uh, train dogs for a lot of things. Dogs can go to different situations as a word, and they can uh, be trained to respond and to be calm and to be cooperative with humans. So he started this question, this uh, field, wondering if it was possible to train a dog to remain still inside a scanner, and then we can have a comparative approach because it's not only that we are using the same tool, it's also that the dogs is a, in a more uh, comparative, in a more uh, similar cognitive state than humans because they are there in the lying in the inside the scanner in a cooperative, voluntary way. We will talk more about this, but I think it's a really nice approach. As you can notice, I am a big fan of this methodology, the fMRI, because I think it's a window to the dog brain, and uh, it's a tool to study the brain in a comparative and evolutionary perspective. And here is the uh, another great thing about dogs. The another great thing about dogs, because we can choose any species if we want to study a, um, in brains, but why dogs? Because dogs are a special species. Of course, uh, when you study a species, this species is special for you, and they are another great uh, models. But specifically talking about the dogs, as you can see in this uh, simple uh, di diagram, uh, here is the humans, and here are the chimpanzees because they are our closest, uh, uh, the closest species to us, and. 
um, the idea is that more or less six million ago, both species were separate and he was the last uh, common ancestor. We are primates. And sometimes uh, uh, we can study the cognitive abilities of chimpanzees and humans and compare it. When we use this approach, we are talking about homology. And the idea is that these cognitive abilities were, pre were present already in the common ancestor, more or less here. But when we are studying dogs, the story is different because our last uh, more or less uh, common ancestor was uh, 16 million ago. Then it was a separation between primates and carnivores. And then we have that the wolf, where uh, the dogs were separate from the wolf. There is a controversy, but it's more or less uh, 50,000 years ago. But then, and here's a really nice uh, part of the study, the dogs, they are uh, sharing the environment with humans. So now humans, we are a relevant part of uh, the environment and understand uh, and cooperate with us. It was important for them and for adapting to the environment. So even if the chimpanzees, they are closer to us in a, a species relationship, with the dogs, we share different aspects and we share the environment, we share many of the um, challenge in, uh, in the everyday. So and there is another thing about dogs. Uh, other important thing is that dogs uh, were, were domesticated. In, it was a process. Uh, 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 the domestication, and during this process, the I, I don't want to say the goal, but I will say dog. Uh, the goal was to cooperate with humans because they are other species, uh, domesticated species. But uh, the main focus or the main function function in the human environment was different. For example, the pigs were more related to food, and with the dogs, it was a different selection than in, in, during this process. So when we study uh, dog brain with fMRI, we can have really nice uh, images of our brains as this and I like so much because it's my dog, Kun Kun. Uh, but a study the dog brain uh, with fMRI is not always so easy and also we have limitations. And to start the talk, I we would like to share with you some of the common challenges that we have uh, using this uh, technique. The first is the training. As I mentioned before, uh, we need that the dog uh, remain still inside the scanner. But when we are say, uh, saying still, it's really, really still. The maximum movement that we can have is three millimeters. And usually our experiments uh, last uh, five, six minutes. So it's, it's a lot uh, for the dogs. And also the thing is that it's difficult to, uh, to tell, to explain to the dog what is the, uh, what is the task. So for this is a training. In the training fields, uh, I uh, tend to visit to the dogs in their houses. So they are in a comfortable environment. It's also a time to know better is, uh, the dog and how is, uh, her person their personalities. Uh, she's era. And the task is uh, teach to the dog then the, the task is to remain still. But of course, we start with some seconds and then a reward. And when the dog is able to maintain this um, position, a Phoenix position, we go to a mock scanner. And in the mock scanner, the dog is, uh, the dog is now training to wear earphones to protect uh, them from the noise from the scanner. And also we uh, tell to the dog that now uh, he need to do the, this uh, task remain still, but inside a toner, and also then the table will be moved. So they are little things that the dog need to learn and to stay okay. Then the dogs, they are visiting the real scanner. And finally, we can start experiments when the dogs, they are wearing the coil and they are inside 
the real scanner, usually seeing or hearing uh, stimuli. In all, all these dogs, they are family dogs. And uh, this is great because uh, the dogs are living all the time with their families. They are normal dogs. They are uh, really love, uh, lovely dogs, but they only spend some afternoons or nights with us in the hospital to run the experiments. And the rest of the time they are okay and they are living in with their families. We believe that the mental state of the dog is more similar than humans because they are relaxed and this is important. They can leave the session at any moment. So as you can see, they are not um, uh, physically restrained. So if they don't go okay or if they prefer to do, they can leave the session and there is uh, possible and there isn't any punishment uh, about that. So we believe that, ah, sorry. And uh, other different, uh, another good thing is that all the time in the scanner room, there is the trainer and also the owner of the dog. So the dog is relaxed and uh, we can compare more uh, between humans and dogs under the similar situation, experimental situation. Then the second challenge that we have is the anatomic variability. As you can, uh, as you know, the dogs, they are really different in size and also in the shape of their heads. So it's difficult uh, to be able to generate uh, our results from one kind of uh, dog uh, head, shape head to another different. As you can see, the brain uh, had a big variation uh, across uh, breeds, but Fortunately, uh, we study mainly the mesencephalic dogs, so we can generalize more or less between them, but we try to be careful about the specific regions or the specific uh, uh, circuits that we are proposing uh, across other breeds because the variability is huge. And also it's not only about the shape of the heads, it's also about the functions. There are a lot of papers that show that the way that, that border collie see the world is not the same than uh, another kind of uh, breed, for example, Siberian the Koskis. So it's, it's complex to uh, take account all this variability across breeds, but uh, we are in the beginning. I hope in the future we will have more uh, information. And indeed, they are a really nice lab in the st in States when they are studying the functional and anatomic variability about, uh, across breeds. The third uh, issue is technical because uh, we are adapting all the tools that we have for humans to the dogs. Uh, they are not have a special coil or a special uh, scanner. And this is good because we, uh, we were able to start this kind of experiments, but it's not great because all the things they are designed and tailored for humans. So uh, in the future, I think we will get better results and we, can, we will be able to ask uh, com more complex questions when we have a better uh, uh, context or well, no, experimental tools to study the dog brain. And another big difference uh, between study dogs and humans is that we only with dogs we only use passive stimulation this means that the dog they are seeing or hearing stimuli but they are not uh, emitting or responding actively to our stimuli for example uh, i tend to study faces so the dogs they are inside the scanner they are, they are seeing faces uh, different kind of faces but we cannot ask to the dog if uh, they are recognized this as a face if they like or uh, any kind of response uh, from them so this is a problem but they are clever people that they are solving this uh, kind of problems by uh, testing the dog in behavioral tasks 
outside the scanner. So you, you have outside the scanner um, response, a behavioral response, and then we can, they can uh, correlate uh, this response with the activity. I will show you a really nice experiment uh, results in the next, uh, in the following slides. But this is a kind of things that we can do uh, for improve our studies. And I think it's the last uh, challenge that I want uh, to share today is about the sample size. All our dogs, they are, they are special, strange, or no common dogs because uh, we are asking them to stay, uh, remain still inside the scanner. So they are dogs with a um, basic, at least, training. And uh, usually they are. Uh, Special dogs more in the sense of they are uh, uh, availability and also their families. And for because of the training, then usually to, uh, it can to, uh, take months or weeks, depending on the availability. We have in our experiments and small sample size. And also the same dogs uh, tend to participate in several studies. This is not uh, the best situation, but at least we can uh, study the story, uh, the story of the dogs. We can check if, if the across the studies, if one dog is responding more in a more independent, for example, or they are having stronger responses to certain kind of stimuli. But of course, we would like to have bigger samples and more about uh, trainer dogs. One of these. Um, um, Things is about how to strange is your study animals because this can affect in the results and interpretation and how much you can generalize. I take the example of Rohan. She's a border collie, she's a, is our friend. Uh, we love a lot of Rohan, but uh, she's is a, a normal dog, as I mentioned before. They are they live with their families. Uh, sometimes Rohan likes to wear a crown. She go to touristic places, but also she helps us in our studies. She's one of the dogs uh, trained to remain still inside the scanner. And for example, after all this uh, pandemic break in the scanner, it was more than a year without going to the scanner. And then the first. Uh, experiment that we were run, it was perfect in, in the sense of the movement. So here is the results of Rohan after one year in, uh, without go to the scanner. Here in the X axis, you can see the time is more or less, is more than three minutes. And here in the Y axis is the movement. As you can see, is 0 uh, 0.3, the maximum, millimeters. So she's great. Uh, uh, sometimes we are wondering if they are breathing because this movement is really, really good. And Rohan, once he learned the task, all the time uh, she is uh, re really good uh, on it. But of course, Rohan is a special dog and she has a lot of advantages. So, for example, she's a water collie, is well socialized, is living with a loving family, is healthy, and she has a lot of experimental experience in the department with uh, she participates a lot in behavioral uh, experiments and also she has a great personality. So, uh, all our studies, we are not sure that we can generalize or extrapolate uh, uh, our results to all the dogs, because we know that sadly most of the dogs they are not living in these situations. So we they, they try to be careful when we say all the dogs uh, can do or do this processing in this or that way, because we know than the dogs that, that we are studying, they is only an, a small spectrum. And I don't know if the person that uh, uh, turned on the camera has a, a question. If you have a question, we can. No? OK. But it's nice to see you, because then it's uh, difficult to say I, <laughs> I am alone. So thank you <laughs> for it. So no more problems. Now I we will talk with you about results. And uh, I would like to start with our last study about uh, languages. And our question was, is can dogs' brain differentiate languages? 
So in this study, uh, we inspired by Kunku, a traveler dog. Is, uh, Kunku is my dog and he grown up in Mexico and then we moved to Hungary. Here in Budapest, people is really, really nice with the dogs. They can be really, really cold with you as a human, but with the dogs, they are as the most sweet uh, people in the world. They are uh, talking to the dog. They are uh, really, really talk people here. But I noticed that my dogs, they are happy with the situation, with a lot of attention, but also they were strange with why, uh, why you are in this way. And um, I, I hypothesized that maybe it was because of the language, because here the people is talking in Hungarian. So the, our question was, if the dogs can notice this difference, we know that babies can do it. We know uh, sometimes when we visit a touristic place, we say, okay, I don't know what language is this, but at least I know that it's not Spanish. And maybe something from Asia, I don't know. Uh, so we have uh, at least this kind of um, differentiation or discrimination process. And we know, as I mentioned, that also babies can do it. So we test dogs' neural sensitivity to auditory irregularities that characterize language, so languages. In, for this experiment, we present four uh, kind of stimuli. The first one, taking as example Kun Kun, it was a familiar language. This is fragments from the Little Prince in Spanish. Sois como era mi zorro. No era más que un zorro semejante a cien mil otros. Pero yo le hice mi amigo y ahora es único en el mundo. Also, we present fragments uh, from the Little Prince in Hungarian. Egy másik bolygón? Igen. Nekem egy búzatábláról nem jut eszembe semmi. Te vagy a hibás, mondta a kis herceg. And as controls, we talk these audios and break into mini windows than 30 milliseconds and then reorder in a semi-random way. The, uh, well, well, the main uh, thing... Uh, the main objective about this, it was to keep this, all the audios, but we break uh, the, uh, the speech. So it was the same in a physical, acoustical thing, but when you hear these new controls, they didn't sound anymore as speech, indeed they sound unnatural. This is from the Spanish. <laughs> Ah, this is the unfamilia. So here we decided to use uh, fragments from the little prince because uh, we know from uh, another experiments that dogs can detect in uh, and recognize, recognize uh, words as you know also this, for example, the names or special words as praise or food or sentences. So here we want to study if the dogs, they are catching the, this rhythm that is in the language and no specific words. For that, we use uh, the Little Prince, who is a lovely story, but it was not relevant or familiar uh, for the dogs. Our question uh, were two. The first one was about speech detection. We were looking for uh, cerebral regions that can discriminate between both languages uh, versus the both uh, controls. And the second one, we were looking for uh, cerebral regions that can discriminate between both languages, but not between the two controls. In this way, we were sure that the discrimination uh, it was more, it was about the languages and not about some acoustical cues and maybe we uh, didn't control very well. And here is the result. First, about the um, question uh, the speech versus the scramble speech, we found that the regions close to the near primary auditory cortex here in the red uh, scale. Uh, in the bilateral uh, response, they are discriminate the cerebral patterns between both kind of stimuli. So this is the first part of the, um, the process. First, the dog, the dog brain is deciding if this is speech or is not a speech and is similar than humans do usually. So here is in the primary auditory cortex. 
But the strange uh, thing in dogs is that they can uh, do the uh, um, differentiate between language and no language, but it was in the opposite way than usually we uh, the humans do. Here in this graph is the uh, cerebral response in the uh, y axis, and here in the um, x axis is all the stimuli that we have. Here, all this is the natural speech in Spanish and in Hungarian, and here, is on the, here they are the controls. The controls are in Spanish and in Hungarian. And we found the only difference, uh, significant difference in the response, it was between the speech and no speech. But uh, as you can see a bit, but it was uh, for sure in the statistical analysis, is that the response to the scrambled speech, to the controls, it was bigger. And usually with the humans, we saw the opposite effect. Uh, our brains tend to respond more to speech than to other sounds, which is logical because the speech is important for us as humans. But uh, we noticed this uh, uh, unexpected uh, result in dogs. We would like to explore more of this in future studies. And now about the distinction between the languages, Spanish and Hungarian, we found that the cerebral patterns in mainly the secondary auditory cortex, secondary, they are the regions that can discriminate between both. This is interesting and nice because uh, as uh, I mentioned before, it, was, uh, it seems that the first step is, this is language or not, speech or not. And then in the second uh, step is, where is my familiar language or is an uh, unfamiliar language? Uh, about this region, another important thing is that this can discriminate between the both uh, languages, but not between the two controls. So we can rule out that the discrimination was based in other acoustical uh, property. And uh, also we found an interesting effect when the grid responses to the languages was in older dogs. Here is in the uh, y axis the difference between uh, in the brain representation between both languages. So here in this talk it was uh, representing uh, it was a better representation because the representation was uh, farther uh, from them. And then here is the in the x axis the age of the dogs. So the older dogs were better uh, in this process. And, at least at the cerebral level. And we think this is a really nice uh, uh, result because uh, in this, uh, uh, based on this, we can suggest that the language representation is based on the experience of the dog. Because um, usually the older dogs have a more experience with uh, their languages. Our conclusion about this experiment was the speech detection, it was more related to a naturalness processing. So as we have this unexpected effect where the bigger response, uh, cerebral response was to the scramble stimuli, the control, we believe that the dogs, it was not saying this is a speech or not a speech. Based in our results, we believe that it was more about this sounds natural and this sounds non natural. It's necessary to run more experiments to be sure about this, but so far this is our suggestion about our results. And then about language representation, uh, uh, we suggest that this is reflecting learning about auditory regularities. And this is a really nice uh, result because we never uh, teach our dogs how their language sounds. We never say, okay, this is an important uh, day in your, in your life. You need to uh, learn about the Spanish. But we are talking all the time. We are talking, we are uh, watching uh, TV series. Uh, and in general, all our environment is surrounded. The dogs, uh, they are surrounded all the time by language, by speech. And we believe that the dogs learn all this uh, about these auditory regularities only by exposition and because they are paying attention to us as a huge social stimuli. So I, I think this is nice and reflect uh, how the dogs, they are paying attention to humans. Because it's, not a, a, it's a, related with the beginning of the talk that we are not um, a choosing, a choosing a 
a random species because maybe we can teach this to other species because all the brains they are able to learn patterns but it's interesting that dogs can do this without explicit training and it's only because they are in their natural and um, usual lives but this is not the only experiment and to finish this talk i would, would like to uh, talk more about what we are doing in the neurotology of communication lab this is uh, led by dr atila andish he is my supervisor and a great supervisor and person and he start all these interesting questions about the speech so he uh, is an expert in human speech and then uh, uh, he started this nice group in Budapest. So uh, the first, first experiment about this, it was uh, some years ago and it was about the species. So um, he present to the dogs and humans, the same stimuli to, uh, to start this um, exciting field. And I uh, want to share some, uh, show you some of the stimuli that dogs and humans here inside the scanner. They are sounds uh, from dogs, from humans, or from environment. They are dogs. And... Also, we have humans. <laughs> and environment. So uh, when the dogs and the humans hear this stimuli, it fears the dogs, you can see the um, regions with a preference for each kind of stimuli. So for the dog stimuli, it was in blue, for humans in red, that is just a small part, but it's something. And by the environmental, uh, uh, sounds in green. And here is the dog brain. This part is the frontal, more close to the eyes. And this is the posterior part of the brain. We are seeing a lateral view. And as you can see, most of the uh, activity uh, about the species, it was from uh, to the dog uh, sounds. And it was a small part for humans, and it was mixed for the environmental sounds. Hearing the same stimuli, this is the results that we have for humans. As you can see, for humans, most of uh, the brains uh, showed a preference from human uh, sounds here in red. And this is logical because uh, the most important stimuli for each species is their own species. Uh, we found a similar effect with faces in which dogs can process and have a um, uh, differentiate between human faces and other kind of stimuli. But when we compare dog faces and human faces, they dedicate uh, more, uh, they, they show a brain preference to dog faces and the same in humans. They prefer human faces. So um, one option is that um, the species and the specific effect. It, it, this means the a pre, a brain preference for their own species is one of the principles of organization in the dog brain. But this is uh, this was the first uh, comparative study between dogs and humans uh, in, in auditory stimuli. Then there is a, a slightly different. Uh, um, experiment because here instead of the fMRI technique, they use uh, EG uh, with electrodes. They are measuring the electrical activity of the brain and not the hemodynamic response as with fMRI. Here in this experiment, uh, led uh, by Magyari Lila, they were asking if the dogs were uh, the uh, their brains were able to uh, to perceive. Uh, subtle, uh, small differences between words. Here is uh, they present to the dogs, Hungarian dogs, fam uh, familiar word, Giere, 
which means uh, com. So it's a super uh, familiar and use uh, word for the dogs. It was uh, then they're compared with a similar word. Here is uh, only one letter of difference, but Hungarians has a lot, a lot of vowels. They have more than 10, I think 14 vowels. So this is big, a big thing and a big difference for them. And then also they compare with a nonsense word that in Hungarian a nonsense word is dime. Uh, I will show you uh, how sounds the uh, each word and think if you can perceive the difference. For me, it's almost impossible. But here is the first, Gere. 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 Second one. Gere. So it, it was really similar. And the uh, no sense is different, of course. Dime. But between this, uh, this uh, pair, uh, pair of words, Gere. This. Gere. It was too similar for me and also for the dogs because they only uh, found differences between, uh, in the electrical response in the brain uh, between the familiar words and the no sense words. This and this, for example, but not between the familiar and similar word. Um, um, there are another uh, studies, behavioral studies, when they show that dogs can discriminate and perceive small differences, but in this study, it was not uh, possible to um, find a difference between the familiar and the similar word. And for example, the other behavioral studies, they use words and they are more usual, usual or familiar for the dogs, for example, their names. With their names, the dogs show uh, in, in behaviorally, a similar response to, uh, than humans, uh, this cocktail party effect, when no, ma uh, no matter when you are, if you are in a noisy um, party environment, if you hear your name, you are paying attention. So dogs also can do this, but in this experiment, uh, it was not a difference between a familiar and a similar world. Then in another experiment that I think is one of the uh, nicer uh, studies here from the lab. They study the uh, processing of the tone and the meaning of the words. So uh, everyone uh, has known that the, here that dogs only can process in the tone and not the meaning of the words. So they test uh, these two variables and they have words, uh, positive words, praise words, in a positive tone, in a neutral tone, also neutral words, and in this study was prepositions, in a positive and a neutral tone. They found that these regions, uh, that this is the anterior part of the brain, and this is the posterior part. And uh, here they are showing their uh, regions and they are responding to all the words versus silence. And they found that a region, an auditory region, the meat uh, ectosilvian gyrus, can discriminate uh, between the tone. As you can see, the difference was between the positive uh, the tone, that is the small p, versus the neutral tone. So in this region, it was the processing of the tone independent of the meaning of the word. But then uh, the nice and the bigger uh, result, it was then the talk in, it was a region, the caudate, nucleus caudate, that usually is uh, linked to the uh, processing of rewarding rewards. So we say when something good is happening to you, it's an activity in the caudate. And in the dogs, it's a part of the brain that has been studied a lot from a team in the States. And they, they found that, for example, uh, the caudate is responding to food, to praise, but also to others, for example, or from humans or others, and it's a, a familiarity also um, effect in dogs. But coming back to this experiment, Kiri was really, really nice because this region, this small region, the right caudace, it was a functional connectivity. Uh, they show a functional connectivity between the caudate and this uh, 
auditory region when they are uh, hearing in general the positive uh, words it was also connect no it was not only an auditory processing it was uh, also uh, involving the rewarding uh, of this town but the bigger uh, response in the caudate it was to the positive words with positive tone so in this region it was not only important the tone that we are using or the stimuli was presenting so here is the other positive tone it was neutral word with positive tone but only the positive the when it was integrated both the meaning and the tone, it was the bigger response in this uh, region. Now well, it's a really, really nice experiment and result. And I think to finish, um, this is my favorite um, study for the group. It was led by Anna Gawor. And in this, they presented the sounds of the owners of the, from the dogs. So here in the positive tone, we have a positive tone of a familiar person who is the owner, and you can hear. Again, it's a Hungarian owner, so this stimuli uh, has everything. It was a positive tone, it was positive uh, words, and also it was by a familiar uh, person to the dog uh, with an um, attachment relation to them. Then they present also neutral uh, words. No, neutral tone with familiar person, and I think also it was words. Yes, this is neutral, it was uh, recipes. So it's from the familiar person, but neutral tone, neutral words. And as control, they use the owners from other dogs. So in this way, it was a balance between the participants. And... And here is the result. First is all the regions that were responding to the stimuli, to the words. And this is the anterior part of the brain. This is the posterior. And it's again a lateral view, the left and the right brain. Then here is when it's uh, more about the results, because here uh, they are showing was the regions that they are more responding to the owner in positive, uh, the positive words of the owner versus the neutral uh, words by the owner. Here is the uh, yellow scale. And it's not super good, more or less. So here in this region, in the, uh, this is a auditory region, the ectosilvian uh, gyrus, the caudal part. It was responding more, again, to the owner but with the positive uh, words. And uh, the caudate, it was, uh, uh, has a similar pattern when the stronger response were uh, to the positive uh, words by the owner. And these results, uh, they are similar to the previous uh, study. But then, this was the nice uh, study that I mentioned before, because they found a correlation between the response in the caudate uh, with attachment. So it's outside the scanner, they run um, a behavioral test about uh, to score that the attachment that the uh, talk show to the, the owners. And they found that when the attach it was bigger, also was the cerebral response in the caudate to the owner uh, words in general. In this, for example, is, in, is both the positive and the neutral uh, stimuli. If, if uh, from the owner, is uh, the, we see this uh, positive correlation. And I think it's a really, really nice experiment and way to finish this part. Of course, there are more studies, there are many more things, but I think this is a good selection about the uh, Dr. Attila Andich's work from the uh, last years. 
So we know that the dog, uh, the dog brain can process uh, species vocalization, the words with positive and neutral tones, then integrate uh, in the caudate, the tone and the meaning. They can identify a familiar voice and also identify a familiar language. But, and this is exciting, there are a lot of things that we didn't know about the dogs and how they are perceiving their world. And some of the uh, questions that we have is, uh, for example, if there are differences in processing nouns and verbs, there are some uh, observation and uh, things here in the lab that seems that for the dogs is uh, easier or they have a better um, learning and memory about the verbs as actions. We tend to ask to the dogs a lot of action and it seems they are, can remember and learn faster in comparison to the nouns. For example, names of toys. It seems for, it's not easy for all the dogs. Also, we don't know uh, so much at this point about the domestication effect. To study this, we can, uh, we would like to study uh, different bread, uh, breeds. Uh, for example, independent uh, breeds more close to uh, the wolf in general, in comparison with uh, our traditional um, fMRI dogs as the border collies. But also uh, in the lab, they are efforts to study another species as pigs. And they are uh, really nice uh, studies in uh, how the pigs are uh, really um, had this relationship with humans. And uh, other things that we don't know is about the integration, about sensory modalities, because the dogs, when we talk to our dogs, when we are uh, saying uh, the words, is not only our words, it's also our body, it's also our all us. So uh, we would like to study more about integration uh, across um, uh, sen sensory modalities. And one thing that, that is a bit, uh, surprising that we don't know if is the dog brain show a sensitivity to human voices. This is a stronger response to um, uh, human vocalization in comparison to all, uh, uh, other sounds because in the experiment that I show you uh, when we uh, uh, when the authors show a human dog and environmental sounds it was a comparison when it was uh, competing the species the, the Dogs are important to dogs, so they we they observe a um, stronger response to them than it was humans. But what what uh, could happen if we present to the dogs a vocalization from other non relevant species? So we are uh, thinking about this, and we would like to uh, design an experiment when we present um, another vocalization from uh, different species as for example chimpanzees uh, is we could expect a bigger response to humans than to chimpanzees or other canids but it's a um, work that we would like to do and for that uh, thank you so much for all your attention gracias uh, for being today here and we can discuss about dogs whether you think is uh, a good approach or is necessary to do more things so uh, now we can discuss about this